Yep. So uh, over the last couple of months, we've been collecting questions and stuff from the from the association uh, as to uh, the city commission seat that's up for election here. Um, we interviewed candidates last week. Last week, um, and the Basin County Association of Realtors has chosen to officially endorse Kevin Dorsey in the race. And so, Kevin. And 
You know, Mason County, when I, I looked it up, between 2002 and 2007 was the second fastest growing county in the state uh, after Franklin. Franklin County over in Central Washington has been on steroids for years. Um, so, you know, still, still a little bit behind, but catching up. And, you know, I always say there's two parts of population growth. There's natural growth, which is births minus death, and net migration, which is people moving in minus people moving out. And the natural rate of population growth for Mason County is somewhere right around zero. Um, just about over time, just about the same number of babies are born as people who go on to their, on to their reward. Uh, and that's not bad. Mason County is, as I said, didn't have a slide this year, but from last year, uh, is old. I mean, the average median age in Mason County is fairly high by state standards. So the fact that hanging in there with a natural population growth that hasn't gone negative is pretty good. Um, go to the north in Clallam and Jefferson County, so the, the, the natural rate of population growth is distinctly negative. Um, so you don't want to be in there. But what that means is the growth you are having is coming from net migration. You need more people moving in than moving out. And so what, there are several ways you can track migration, none of which are very good. Uh, but one of them is, is driver's licenses. When people move to the state, they trade in their driver's license, and the Department of Licensing knows what state they came from and then what county they're moving into. So for Mason County, we can figure out where people have come from. Uh, so first of all, this is the total of, total of driver's license trade-ins um, each year going back to 1999. So you can see here at the end of 2017, uh, exceeding the level that was back in 2000, what's that, 2004, 5, 6. Uh, so that, now that's gross migration. We, we don't know about people moving out uh, this way. Other states don't keep track, there's good track of this. So, uh, but we know about people moving in, and more people are tending to move in. Where they're coming from, starting at the top, that's Texas. Now, I'm always puzzled by this. People moving here from Texas, but apparently a lot of people move here from Texas. Um, the next is more a good little purple bar. Uh, that's been fairly consistent. The green bar there is California, and California has always been the largest source of migrants for Washington State uh, because it's close and it's really big, and we do a lot of things. There's a lot of complementary industries, so a lot of people tend to come up from California. Uh, the red bar is sort of the balance of the United States, and the blue at the bottom is other Western states. So uh, the big growth there is other Western states and, and the rest of the U.S. Uh, people are coming here from all over, and you probably know those people because you sold some of them a house. Um, but, you know, this, there's a sort of distinct uptick in migration. Now, sort of the good news on population is not really been followed as much on employment. This is total jobs in the county. And as you can see from 2007, we're still not back to where, uh, to total employment uh, that, that was back in 2007. Now, some of that may be demographics, you know, it may be an older population, fewer people, more retirees, I don't know. Uh, but it's, it's not really caught up. And so you might ask, well, where has the loss been? Um, and that's fairly easy to see. So these two bars, this is 2007 on the left, 2016 on the right, by sort of major industries. Starting at the bottom, the bottom two, uh, that kind of rust in the blue, that's government. That's uh, state and local at the bottom, and, or state and federal at the bottom, and, and uh, local. And those are actually growing. Uh, the big loss there is manufacturing and construction. Uh, construction pretty obviously has fallen fell everywhere. Uh, manufacturing, and I have, will confess, I have not tracked the wood products industry here and, and what it's doing, but I suspect that's where a bunch of that fall off is. The rest of them are kind of bumping along the same. Now, if you know, being the art of capitalist that I am, I am bothered by the fact of, of government taking, you know, taking over more of the employment base than the private sector, but if I'm a realtor, it's actually not bad because if you look at wages, um, this is average wages, and there's been actually an impressive amount of wage growth. Uh, you know, which you keep hearing about wages not growing. Uh, they've actually done okay, but if you look at the private sector, that's the, the second set of bars. This is 2007, 2016. Uh, it's much lower than state government and local government. So if I am looking, you know, so what we have is the growth part of the employment base, which is government, is actually the higher wage part. So, you know, they're going to be in a better position to, uh, to buy houses from you. Uh, but getting the private sector back in here is clearly uh, something that needs to happen. Uh, one of the things that shows up in several places is relatively flatness in uh, the sort of you know, accommodation, hospitality, that whole sector, which I know is a priority, and, and, and but it's been fairly flat, so uh, one to look at. 
Uh, another place with some relatively good news is taxable retail sales, something that's easy to track. Um, this is, shows growth, yeah, this is not inflation adjusted, but taxable retail sales growing fairly well. Um, and, uh, the, but the, again, that, that gray bar is the sort of travel entertainment accommodation uh, sector, uh, fairly flat. Uh, construction doing very well there in the, that kind of rust colored bar. So all sort of good news. Uh, and there's other good news as well uh, that I didn't, uh, didn't put up here. So things started sort of catching up. And so to me, that means it's a good time to start talking about the future. And because people want to talk about the future when things are going well. Uh, when things are not, it's like, hey, how can I sell houses this week? And, uh, but so the thing I learned, it was mentioning the introduction, I wrote this book about the future sound economy. And the thing you realize is that geography matters. Uh, where you are in the, in, the, in the state, in the region, in the nation, is extremely important. Uh, a number of years ago, a guy came out with a book called The Death of Distance. Uh, there was another book you may remember called uh, The World is Flat by Thomas Friedman in the New York Times. All sort of suggesting that geography did matter. You could sort of do things anywhere. And that turns out not to be terribly true. Uh, in my view, and, and from what I've seen, and where you are in, in geographically is extremely important. And sort of Mason County sitting there, um, there's a lot of things to be uh, sort of said about that. And uh, it has to be acknowledged that Mason County is a very sort of unique spot within the state. There isn't any other place that's really quite parallel to it. And so, the number of things I want to sort of talk about about geography, because I think that's how you have, that's the starting point, particularly again for a place like Mason County that's pretty unique. Um, so I can think of several drivers of sort of geographic drivers that are going on right now that you need to, need to keep in mind. Um, the first one is the, the last big spurt of growth in the 2000s was really happening well outside of Seattle. It's, King County grew relatively slowly during that time, and the growth was sort of everywhere else. This time, the growth has all had, is really coming out of Seattle, particularly almost downtown Seattle. Uh, the Amazon phenomenon, which I'm sure all of you have not missed. Um, in the, the previous, that 2002-2007 boom period, Seattle was, was about, or King County was about 20% of the state growth. This time, it's 40% of the state growth. I think you throw in Pearson, Snohomish County, you're up over 60 years, almost two thirds of state growth happening in those three counties. That's very different. Um, and what that is, is predominantly younger people moving into apartments. I mean, single family construction is down everywhere. It's doing no better in that area than it is anywhere else. A little better than Snohomish, but, um, you know, it's, it's younger people moving into apartments. Now, contrary to what you may have heard, um, you know, the millennials are going to be buying houses. Uh, and that's what all these people are. So they're moving in. I have, I have one exquisite data point on this. Uh, my son and his wife just bought a house when they were And uh, the, the funny thing is they, they, they consider themselves sort of slightly alternative people. They have tattoos and they do all this stuff. And they bought a house down in Sacramento that is so absolutely California subdivision you get. Uh, I love it. Uh, but they're very happy there, and uh, having lived in the middle of Sacramento with all the urban stuff, you know. Um, but sort of the next thing that happens is, you know, the, these millennials start to get married and have children, or have children, they get married, um, and they start looking for houses. And where are they going to look for houses? Because nobody's really building anything. And also, and I talked about this all last year, contrary to popular views, the baby boomers aren't going anywhere. They're staying in their houses. So there's not a lot of real estate being freed up. So that group of people is going to start pushing out. Yeah, the pressure for single family houses, the ones who are working for at Amazon for lots of money will be buying up the houses in uh, close to Seattle and those push those prices up and those people start to move out. Look further, and that sort of is point number three, is this cascading of demand up and down the I-5 corridor. Um, and this is real, and I, I document, there's a wonderful set of data that comes from the Internal Revenue Service, where they keep track of people who change their address and their tax returns. And so it tracks people who be moving between counties. And they're, unfortunately, they're about to be <coughs> behind all the time. But I saw this you know, 10 to 15 years ago, you can see this exact pattern, and it's happening again, where people get priced out of Seattle and the Bellevue area, and then they move to South King County. 
That pushes prices up in South King County. Those people get, who are working down there in the warehouse industrial areas, they move to Pierce County. Pierce County prices get pushed up, they move to Thurston County. Thurston County prices get pushed up, they move to Lewis and Mason County. This is an unmistakable pattern. So I, privacy walls are happening again. And it is. So this chart, which I'm not sure is terribly readable, but um, this um, over here, this is the movement of people between King and Pierce County. So blue bar going down is people moving south from King to Pierce. Orange bar is people moving north of Pierce to King. And the net is the stubby little bar there. So there's definitely a net flow of people from King to Pierce County. That is more than balanced off by a huge net flow of people moving from out of the state into King County. So it's a very clear pattern. People move from other states into King County. People move from King County into adjacent counties. Then you go down here to Pierce to Thurston. And you have a little bit of a net movement, not much, uh, so far from Pierce to Thurston County. Thurston to Mason is actually the other direction right now, but very slightly. It's almost not statistically significant. Um, but you go to the far one, Thurston to Lewis, and there's a little net movement from Thurston to Lewis. This is two-year-old data. Uh, prices in Pierce County have started to shoot up in the last two years quite a lot. So I would expect this pattern uh, to continue. Now, how much of that is, you know, how much of that cascading ends up in Mason County, uh, hard to tell. Uh, but it's an unmistakable pattern and uh, something to watch out for. The fourth point about geography is uh, the term economists use called agglomeration economics. And that is the idea that the more of an activity taking place in an area, the more productive that activity. So that's why you know, the software industry is in Seattle, the entertainment industry in Los Angeles. You know, think, industries tend to cluster together because that's where the talent is, that's where the services are, uh, and all those sorts of things. That tends to keep things like software and those high paying industries clustered into a place like Seattle. But there's a tension there once, you, once housing prices start to go up. Is, is that pulling people out? And then people finally, industry is saying, you just can't afford to be here anymore. How that's playing out is not at all clear. It seems to be starting finally to play out in the San Francisco Bay Area, where company, some companies are finally saying, you know, I just, we just can't afford to be here anymore. Uh, we're paying our employees lots of money, and they still can't afford uh, to live here. How that plays out, again, is, is uncertain. But one thing will be more certain and that is companies that can't afford to pay a lot will be moving somewhere. And will they be moving to Mason County? I don't know. Uh, when you look at you know, sort of future economic development, it's sort of like you really you can try targeting software companies, but it might be better to target, say, manufacturers who have been in that area and who are suddenly finding out we really can't afford to be here, we need to be somewhere else. So those are all some drivers. And I'll finish up here with a couple of uh, couple of things to think about in terms of the uniqueness of Mason County and how people who will be living here and why. The first one is, is something I think I've talked about here before, um, and I finally did a really bad little graphic about it. Uh, the ring. This is not Bogner, those opera Um This is a, a something again I saw a number of years ago that seems to be recurring, which is you have a set of counties that are in that between the two the, between the two rings there. Maybe an hour, an hour to two hours from Seattle. Um, so you start at the top, Whatcom and Skagit, over to Chelan, Kittitas, uh, Thurston, maybe Lewis, not really sure, Mason, Jefferson, Clown, Island, those counties um, all grew a lot in the last go around. And I thought, well, are they growing again? Is this something, uh, a, a phenomenon we can see again? What's going on with that particular group of counties? And sure enough, uh, the interesting pattern. So what this shows, uh, the, the blue line is growth in the poor Puget Sound counties. This is greater growth off on the side here. So from zero up to three and a half, four percent. <coughs> the green is the state. So that's sort of lump it all together. And the, Red line is the growth rate for that collection of counties. So what you see is back here in the 90s, when things were really booming in the state, that collection of counties grew very fast. Dot com bust, recession, growth rate dropped considerably. Boom in the 2000s, growth rate goes back up. Great recession, the red line goes down, down even below the state average. And now you see it's pulling back up again. Uh, as things are, are 
are doing. Now, the, you can see the state and then the Puget Sound line is going way up, and that's again that massive growth in Seattle right now. But I don't know quite, I'm trying try to figure out what this means. Um, and I really don't know, and I think it's something that needs a fair amount more research, but it's very real. Um, I've been doing recently, done some work in Island County and up in Whatcom County, um, and they're not really tuned into this, but they know that a lot of people retired there, people moved there, they're telecommuting. I just was ready to a political consultant I've done for years and years. Turns out, I haven't seen him in a long time, he's living on a golf course on Whitby Island now. <laughs> and another guy, a, a, a um, transportation consultant I ran into is living in Friday Harbor. Uh, so there's that kind of thing going on. Is it, is it in retirees? Is it telecommuters? Uh, is it people moving out just so they really want to try to make a rural lifestyle work for themselves? I don't really know, but it's something that's, that's worth watching because Mason County is definitely part of this part of this trend. It's going to operate on a different cycle than the rest of the Puget Sound. That's something worth understanding. The second thing uh, to talk about, and I'll, I'll credit uh, Commissioner Christy Jeffries, is now something else. Um, congratulations again. Um, with this sort of, sort of starting this idea in my head, and I've, I've played around with it a lot, and that is the notion of what it means to be a rural, sort of more rural county. I was doing a presentation not long ago in Olympia, in, in Thurston County, and, and I was sort of upgraded almost by one of the people and said, you know, this is really interesting stuff, but we're a rural county, you know, this isn't urban. And unfortunately, the Growth Management Act, whoops, sees the world like that. Uh, we have what I think is called uh, And we have some farm somewhere that people will pay me. That's the way the Growth Management Act looks at the world. Uh, you're either urban or you're a farm. Uh, as you all know, in a place like Mason County, there's lots of things happening between there. There's a big space between you know, intensely urban and farming. And rural, in the eyes of the GMA, is farming. And farming is wonderful. I just got finished with a project where we're working on trying to get an incubator farm going out in North Bend to help people who want to start farming. And what you realize is that small farming is incredibly difficult. <laughs> um, it is not, you know, there's this romantic notion of the small organic rutabaga farmer. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's really hard work. And to sort of premise the idea that your, all your rural areas are going to be all full of these farms where people, you know, have the happy peasants, um, which we all know don't exist, um, you know, it's just it's not realistic. For rural areas to be economically viable, they need to have a whole bunch of things going on that are not urban, that are not farming, or related to farming, maybe. Um, and those are going to be different everywhere. You drive around rural areas, you see all this stuff out there, you know it's there. Uh, the GMA is distinctly hostile to that kind of activity. And if you try to put it in place, you will get sued by a future wise or somebody because they don't like it. And that's something I think is a big missing piece of the GMA and it's particularly applicable to a place like Mason County. Um, yeah, no doubt. No doubt. <laughs> and this needs a lot of work. I had an interesting conversation with a legislator recently over in Spokane uh, who sees the same thing uh, over in the eastern part of the state. So uh, lots of could be done there, but I think it's going to be a question of banding, you know, the rural counties getting together and really putting pressure on the legislature to deal with this because running the state land use system from, you know, Capitol Hill in Seattle is not, uh, I don't think, a productive thing and not helpful to lots of places. So, on that happy note, I will stop <laughs> and uh, we'll move on. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Dan.
He has held board positions with the Europe, European Real Estate Society, the International Real Estate Society, and the Pacific Rim Real Estate Society. He is also a member of the Royal Institute of Charter Surveyors. His consulting activity has spanned several specialist areas such as affordable housing, corporate real estate, and real estate development. In addition, he has published in several leading academic journals, including Real Estate Economics, Urban Studies, Housing Studies, Journal of Housing Economics, and the Journal of Real Estate Research. Mr. James Young. <laughs> We're trying to get things working here. Uh, I got kind of caught on the hop here with different equipment and compatibility issues. So uh, Mike is letting me borrow his, his gear here. So I think we're set up. Yes. Great. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, thank you very much for your introduction. Um, I'm fairly new here. Um, I've kind of went from Arkansas to Michigan to um, everywhere in the world. And I've kind of been a lot of places. And so for me to come here in Mason County and say, look, I know what's happening in Mason County, I can't say that. I'm just going to be straight with you. I, I can't say that. I've only been here since February. And to be honest with you, you guys work on the ground every day. And so my approach to this when I do presentations, obviously, well, one, I'm an economist. And so they tell me that I'm supposed to start these sort of presentations with a joke or some kind of anecdote or something like that. And I'm an economist, so I don't really do that. Uh, but I will assure you that I hopefully will not bore you with uh, tables and graphs and all the rest of this sort of thing. Because I'm a different kind of economist in some ways. Um, I'm an educator. Um, I talk to large lecture theaters of students and that sort of thing. Which makes presenting to you guys rather difficult because you guys know a lot. Um, an 18 year old sitting in a classroom tend not to know much at all. Um, and so it's a bit of a different audience. So if you can kind of bear with me, I'm going to kind of try to tell a story here that's, that's a larger picture, right? A larger picture about how things work in terms of expectations, right? You're all realtors, right? Do you ever try and sell a house on it being the least bad house or the least bad property? <laughs> you can't sell a house that way. It doesn't work. Right? You've got to say, this is a great place, or you show that place. You frame things. You put things in the appropriate context so that people see that the house you want them to get, or the house that is best for them, is framed in such a way that it works. Right? They see, wow, this is a great option. They see the positive side of things. Right? So I'm going to kind of go on a journey here. Right? Remember this guy? Right? Ronald well, Reagan, everybody remember this sort of thing when you ran for re-election, right? Like him or not, right? Morning in America, right? This whole morning in America thing. Everybody remember that? It's old enough, kind of. A lot of most of the, none of the ladies in this room would remember that. Um, but it's this sort of thing, the whole morning in America sort of thing is a positive message, right? But at the time, he was branded an absolute cowboy that was going to start a war with the Soviet Union. Right, and everything else. If you remember, when he ran against Carter the first time, it was just like, he's awful. He's going to destroy the world. We're going to get in a nuclear war. Right, and everything else. Right, don't vote for that guy. But morning in America is a much more positive message. Like it or not, it's a positive message. Then afterward, you had George Bush first, George Herbert Walker Bush, right? And if anybody recalls that election, right, he was a win, right? We've got to remember that Morning in America got the largest expansion of the U.S. economy in terms of whipping inflation, all the rest of the sort of inflation, monetary supply, everything else, in terms of economic growth, right? In terms of post-war period, Cold War period, it was like one of the best periods in American history with Reagan. Bush inherited that. But he was granted a win, right? You know, I don't know about you guys, politics aside, some guy that survives getting shot down in the Pacific and you know, living a few you know, day or two you know, without any help getting rescued, not really a win in my book, but you know, that's the way they framed it, right? But he won that first election. Why? Because things were doing well, the economy was doing well, and he was going to continue the positive frame, right? That's what got him elected. 
right? And then we ran into Bill Clinton. Now, I come from Arkansas, and I have to say, you can vote overseas, and it was only recently that I didn't have a Clinton on the ballot for the first time in my adult life. <laughs> and then Hillary ran. Right? I actually grew up in the congressional district where he got defeated his first election. Right? And when you look at that, it's that positive message. Right? Who remembers the theme song? Theme song. Anybody remember the theme song? Don't stop. Think of that tomorrow. Yeah? Right? But then you've got the other message of let's just continue the same. Right? But continuing the same wasn't starting to work as well. Right? It wasn't working nearly as well. So don't stop thinking about tomorrow becomes a positive message. Right? It becomes something that people can hang their hat on and go, I'm going to go for that. Right? You guys understand this. Right? You guys understand this. And then we have W. Right? Compassionate conservatism. Right? Forget the scandals with Clinton and all the rest of this stuff. Forget everything like that. You had at least a positive message. The message on the candidates before were the candidates against W at the time, we remember, you had compassionate conservatism, right? Everything else. Whether you're conservative or not, at least that's more positive than the world is going to end tomorrow, unless you elect me. Right? Think about positive framing, positive message. The world is going to end tomorrow unless you vote for me. Well, that's the other guy. I'd rather think, okay, we're going to do okay. Let's stick with this guy. It's relativities, right? It's the, it's the sort of relative thing of this. So, we have Bush, everybody, big, huge expansion of the economy. The economy did really well. The global financial crisis, like the green span and everything else, the economy did really well. Everything performed really well until the global financial crisis hit, right? And the global financial crisis hit, and people were really starting to feel unsure about things, right? 2006, 2007. So what did we get? Hope and change. Right? This frame continues. Hope and change. Hope and change. Right? You have a positive message. Everybody else is like, what, what do you find against? What do you find against that? Right? Can you be more positive than that? It's hard. Charismatic, you have historical figure, right? The historical figure in terms of what he achieved. Right? Whether you agree with him or not, it's a, it's a historical figure. Right? In terms of the first black president, everything else. It's a positive message. Right? Then we have Make America Great Again. Doesn't this start to sound familiar? Right? You have Reagan, not, I'm not saying Trump is Reagan under any stretch of the imagination, but if you say Make America Great Again, right? And the other candidate is saying they're going to start doing the award or cowboy, oh my god, the world's going to end. Right? Which one is going to sell that house? You guys know this. You're not going to sell a house if you say this is the least bad. Okay? So this is where I'm going to go here. Because rather than telling you what's going on in Mason County, rather than telling you what's happening right now, what's happening right now I don't think is important. What happened in the last couple months isn't that important, I don't think I, I don't think it's nearly as important. Right? So, make America great again. Okay? That's the future you're talking about. It's not now. It's the future. Okay? So, the idea is people have expectations. People don't buy houses, they don't invest in real estate, they don't do any kind of economic activity that requires anything unless they have an expectation that things are going to get better. Or things are at least going to stay the same. Right? They have that expectation they're going to do things. Right? Unless they have it, nothing's going to happen. People are going to say, well, I'm just going to wait. Okay? So expectations matter. Feeling good matters. Right? Feeling good, having those great expectations matters. Okay? And that presents a particular challenge in places like Mike brought up that are, that are kind of outside of urban areas where you have lots of activity and lots of buzz and lots of growth and that sort of thing going on. It creates particular challenges in terms of how do you frame what is going on? How do you put it in a way to where it's a positive message, where it's a positive thing in terms of what is happening right now? Where does it go forward? Okay? 
So, just a chart that I borrowed. I borrowed a bunch of charts from people here. I tend to do that. I created up with my own. Uh, we have a market analysis report that is 30 pages of tables and charts and that sort of thing. And hopefully, I'm not, I'm not going to bore you with that. That's, <laughs> tables and charts are not. But this one chart here shows you that even under the Obama administration and everything else, that the positive sentiment about the economy didn't start until just a few months ago. Overall, the positive sentiment about the economy hasn't started except a few months ago. So that's quite a statement. That's quite a statement in terms of where we're going and what we're doing. So, and this is borne out a lot of other things. But we know that that positive expectation, feeling good, people, if they don't have a job, they're not going to buy a house. If they're worried about losing their job, they're not going to buy a house. Right? If they're worried about what's going to happen in the future, I'm not going to earn enough money to pay the mortgage, they're probably not going to buy a house. Right? So when we get to expectations, and we deal with those overall expectations, like you have with presidents and everybody else, <coughs> and use those frames to try and get elected, right? let's look at it in terms of what is likely to happen in the future and what effect that's going to have on the three things that are required to buy a house. Right? You've got to have a job. Okay? You've got to have a job. So what's going on with jobs? I think we could go there, right? That guy looks really happy. <laughs> Manufacturing job, everything else. Right? <coughs> but those jobs, right? Now, you may say, well, he's coming from Seattle and everything else. I mean, I, I, I grew up in the country, and I, I have a certain sympathy with manufacturing jobs, because those jobs are where they are. Those jobs are where they are. Same with a lot of agricultural jobs in the world. They're, they're where they are. Right? But growth in those areas, as you get more robotics, as you get more things going on with technology, those jobs are ceasing to exist. And it's somewhat unstoppable as technology keeps going, right? Just to remember the point in terms of how it's going, and this is sort of the future telling stuff here, the framing. What do those two things have in common? Anybody have an idea? You need maintenance. <laughs> that is a crack and bit me. Whistle jet engine, right? And the other one is an installed swimming pool. What do those two things have in common? Anybody want to have a go? Pre-manufactured. What's that? Pre-manufactured. Pre-manufactured? Partially, yeah. Partially pre-manufactured. They're put in place where they can go. That's partially it, right? Partially, but I think there's another more important thing that's going on here. Right? They both need maintenance. What's that? They both need He's getting hot. He's, this, is, this guy's hot, right? This guy's hot. We're both getting So, how much, right? How much do you think those things cost? Anybody want to have a guess at how much they cost? Yeah. A lot. I'd say half a million for the jet engine. Fair enough. What if I told you the thing they have in common is that they are both free? They are both free. Absolutely free gratis. As long as you sign the maintenance agreement that goes with them. <laughs> and that maintenance agreement is where people make their money. Right? The maintenance agreement is where those guys are going to make their money. And when they make their money off the maintenance agreement, what happens to the jet engine and the swimming pool components? They become things where you drive the cost down as much as you possibly can. Because the maintenance agreement is going to have a cost that people can predict and it's there, and that's what they're going to pay, and they're willing to pay it. So the cost of producing that has to go down. That's why manufacturing jobs are going. It's because it's relatively inefficient to have a guy standing there doing something. You've got to pay it where a robot can do it faster, more efficiently, each and every time the same way. So that they invest in that technology because that is simply a cost to get a maintenance contract. 
That's the way big ticket items are working now, right? It's pretty frightening. It's pretty frightening. I mean, when I saw, when I saw that, I was just like, that's for free? No way. You know? Nobody can make a check. They do. Right? That's the way it works. And that's not my swimming pool, by the way. <laughs> I work at the university. We don't, we don't have that sort of stuff. <laughs> right? But where the robots are, I kind of borrowed another bricking slide here. Right? But look at the old manufacturing rust belt. I mean, that's where the robots are. That's where those component parts, those things that come together to make the big item used to be produced. That's where you used to have people producing them. Now you have robots producing them. And if you notice that where the robots are, are the places that a population decline, the old rust belt, that you hear about abandoned houses. Detroit, my old stomping ground when I started out in this business doing fire insurance appraisals in the 80s. It was fun. Right? That's just red zone there. Right? Manufacturing is robotic. Right? So, as realtors, do we want manufacturing jobs somewhere? Maybe the few jobs that come will be people to maintain the robots, and that sort of thing, but it may mean a net out migration to the area. Well, that doesn't help sell houses. <laughs> that doesn't help in terms of what's going to happen. Right? So when people say, oh, well, we want an expansion of the agriculture and manufacturing and all this sort of thing, it's becoming more robotic. And I saw a presentation, a buddy of mine from Ellen School of Machine State. Most of the guys I went to school with work in the auto industry or in the agricultural machinery industry. Right? Just those are the territory. Right? You're working that close to the motorized industry. Right? One of them works for John Deere. Right? And they can completely automate wheat farming. Almost entirely. One guy sitting there with an iPad, he's got four or five combine harvesters out there, and he's just directing them all over his iPad. Mm -hmm. Nobody's driving them. Right? So that's the sort of thing that if you, if you find what is the growth of the economy, it's not that. It's not that. So the robot is making a tractor that's going to be driven by one dude and an iPad. It's kind of crazy, right? Now, we look at cities and all the rest of this stuff, what cities do and everything else, right? And what cities do, and this is the problem that you have in places that are outside of cities. The biggest problem you have outside of cities is that cities are where, you know, people and ideas come together. The money and ideas all come together and have this mix. That's why you get the agglomerations you do. That's why you get the sort of cities that grow around certain industries. Detroit grew because they were around the auto industry. And they had an agglomeration of people that knew autos and cars. That's the reason most of my buddies work in that industry. The reason they do is because they went to school in a place where all the money, ideas, and people came together. That's why Detroit was once a great city. But as things moved on, and as competitors had their own collaborations elsewhere, and the situation changed, it's the ability to adapt that makes it different. And this is where I think Mason County, its proximity to Olympia, its proximity to the growth that's going on in the Puget Sound has a lot of opportunities. Because a lot of opportunities in terms of commuting and jobs. I mean, I came up this morning, and I took I-5, right, in heavy rain, which it was a lot of fun getting through Tacoma. It was loads now. Mm -hmm. right? But I have to say, you kind of hit this place in Olympia that it feels like one year out of the Seattle bubble, which is great. Mm -hmm. And you're kind of in a place that's more like the rest of the world. Okay? And you come up here, it's a nice, easy 20 minute drive. Right? So, what about areas like Mason County? Right? How do you frame Mason County? How do you make Mason County that positive, how do you give that positive message about Mason County? Not forgetting what you've got here, but changing it into what is going on in the job market. Jobs matter. People don't have jobs, they don't buy houses. So how do you frame that? Well, you've got the commuting, you've got everything else. But the cities that breathe innovation and ideas are the ones that are growing. The cities that have those ideas, not just government, are growing. They're the ones where the jobs are. And increasingly, Olympia is becoming part of that. Becoming part of that mix as you get people that are going from King County, Pierce County, they're moving to Thurston County now. They're moving all the way up to Skagit County. We're seeing house prices in the Smoking Point area 
and other places going through the roof right now. Simply because people are jumping, they're going to Everett, and then they're catching a bus in. They're driving to Everett and catching a bus in. I, I lived in a city like that that had similar sort of things to the Growth Management Act, or the Resource Management Act in New Zealand, and I went from a commute that was 30 minutes to when they started building up my life, it was two and a half hours. Just because the growth management act said you can't build here, so people jumped in. Right? People jumped in. People started doing things that they weren't supposed to do. Mason County is prime for that. It really is prime for that. It's just a matter of how it can happen. But that's just it. It's the expectation. Do you think this can happen? And can it happen? Those are the two things you got to think about. All right? Moving up, keep on going with jobs here. There's an interesting thing when you talk about jobs, unemployment, and everything else. Mason County unemployment rate right, somewhere around 6.5% right now. All right? Somewhere around 6.5%, which is pretty low, right? It's come down, it was 8.9% just, just a few years ago. It was up as high as 13, 14%, I believe, in 2011 to 2012 when the crisis was at its peak, right? But you look at this, and this is, I mean, national labor force participation rates are, this tells a story, right? This tells a story. Right? Look at this. There's fewer people participating in the labor force now. The economy's growing, people feel positive, right? But there's fewer people participating in the labor force now than at any time since the 1980s. Right? And why is that? Well, two things happen here, right? This is where I put the like, educator hat on. Right? Put an educator hat on here and say, okay, your labor force participation rate is declining, right? This is data from the Fed. Unemployment rate is way down, right? It's because there are fewer people in the labor force. It's called the denominator effect, right? So if I'm going to take, let's say I'm, I've got 1,000 jobs, right? You've got, you want to take 100 jobs. <coughs> from this area, you've got 1,000 jobs there. 10% unemployment, you've got 10,000 jobs there, you take 100 jobs, nobody's gonna care. It's because your divisor is 10,000, nobody's gonna, nobody's gonna care, right? That's the trick, so. Demographics, you've got a lot of things pulling here. Mike mentioned it before, you've got in non-metro counties, you've got a huge proportion of older people. Younger people are not there, they're not moving there. Right? Economically active people, first time buyers drive housing markets. That's a well known thing. They drive housing markets. Right? So all politics is local, all real estate is local, so it's all expectations driven. Am I going to have a job? Is my area going to keep growing? That's going to depend on the population. That's going to depend on lots of things. Right? Financing. Right? Interest rates are historic lows. Everybody knows that. Right? Everybody knows every year mortgage interest rates are really low. Right? But in terms of disposable income, we're still spending less on housing than before the global financial crisis. People's mortgage interest payments as a proportion of their income is still low. But, right, here's where you kind of can say the bad news here. Because right, expectations always goes on forever. Good news always goes on forever. Right? <laughs> That's who it depends on. <laughs> They're grumpy here looking at pictures. <laughs> right? But that's what it depends on. Because interest rates are at historic low. She's got to raise them at some point. They're near zero. Right? Europe already has negative interest rates. But they already have negative interest rates where you have to pay money to keep your money in a bank. That's crazy. Right? That's crazy stuff. Right? So what's going to happen if you get the next economic shock? What's going to happen when the next economic thing happens? You can't raise interest rates because that's going to kill the economy. It's going to kill the housing market for sure. Right? But we're already at low interest rates. So just something to keep in mind on. You have the great expectations and everything, but at the same time, you kind of have to temper it with what reality is. Right? Now, availability supply is a big thing, especially for Puget Sound reasons, especially when you have growth management act issues. You have all sorts of other issues with um, water, everything else, especially in rural areas in Washington. Right. Availability matters, right? 
This is where expectations matter for developers. Developers have to know they're going to be able to sell that house. They have to know they're going to be able to use, get that property sold at a price where they can make money. And they've got to do it all in advance. So if you're in an urban area like Seattle, you've got to try and figure out if I'm going to get that much money for my house in three years' time, by the time I'm able to sell it. Three years. Or put the shovel in the ground to when I can sell that house. That's a long time to try and figure out what's going to happen in the future. Mason County and even areas like this have an advantage because it ain't going to take 18 months to just put a shovel in the ground. <laughs> right? You may have some issues here, but it ain't going to take that long. Right? So it's in terms of expectations. You can play those expectations in terms of selling your county, selling shelter, selling areas that are near where the growth is to say, okay, we can offer something here that's lower risk. We can offer something here that is a better quality of life, not as tight, all the rest of these sorts of things in terms of housing and the housing stock. Right? Now everybody talks about, I just did a interview with Seattle Bet that just came out with I have an interesting take on housing supply. My idea is don't do a damn thing. Kind of scary. Every politician wants to do something about affordable housing or whatever. I'm saying don't do a damn thing. Right? But anybody know who this guy is? Any, any sort of Shakespearean English people out here? No? No? This guy's named John Haywood. Right? John Haywood. John Haywood right, came up with an expression, Rome wasn't built in a day. Rome wasn't built in a day. The completion of that, which has a lot to do with real estate, is even though they were laying bricks by the hour. Right, they were going as fast as they could, and they couldn't do it fast enough. And since the urban areas can't do it fast enough, since they can't do it fast enough, exurban areas like Mason County possibly can. Right? They possibly can. I'm not saying you need to build a condo and say lots of stuff. But, you know, where do you pitch? Where do you, where do you make the pitch for economic growth here? Right? I'm just going to go on median house prices. Now, your labor force participation rate, if you remember this sort of, this is my only real sort of graphic slide here. Right? On house prices, because I know that Eddie's going to get that in a second. We're going to be rocking on that big time, right? But if you look here, notice that the state of Washington prices have a higher upward trajectory. In the early, well, mid 1990s, right? Median house prices were close to the same, right? Here's a scary statistic. I'm talking about labor force participation. I talked about labor force participation rate earlier, it's somewhere around 63%. Mason County, their labor force participation rate was the same as the state, and national, uh, it was the same as the state average pretty much in 1996. Right? By 2000, it was about 3 or 4% lower. Labor force participation was 3 or 4% lower. Remember the denominator effect. It's a small county with fewer people. So you go down 3%, that's a huge effect here. By 2011, it was 7%. Your labor force participation rate was 7% less than the state average. Now it's closer to 13%. 13% difference between the labor force participation in the state and here. A 13% gap. And in a small county like Mason County, that's a big difference. And you can see it in the house prices. People don't have jobs, people don't buy houses. People don't have the expectation that they're going to keep their job and it's going to grow and they're going to make more money, they're not going to buy a house. Right? And so if you look, that's, that gap is widening. And it's widening greatly. It's not just the King County effect, it's not just the Seattle effect. It's an effect of all the things we've talked about here in terms of how jobs are changing. Jobs are changing to service jobs and collaborations where people, money, and everything can come together. Right? And Seattle is where that's happening in terms of service industries, where people don't build things, people write contracts for other people to build things for them. People do the deals on those things there. That's a completely different world than we've lived in before. Right? 
And where you frame that and where those expectations are has to come down to labor force participation. What are the, what are the people doing here? Right? Now, I know there's other problems, but there's, you know, what do, what do you do? People aren't participating. The unemployment rate is 6.5% here, but yet the participation rate is low. Right? That's a frame that we want to forget. <laughs> that's, a, that's something that we want to sort of say, okay, how do we, how does Mason County change? That's something you guys have to think, I can tell you that. I don't know, that's something you guys have to consider. But as an educator, I'm not here to give you answers, I'm here to sort of frame things in my own way to try and help give an understanding of things. So let's just kind of wrap it up here a bit. I mean, if you look at the jobs, right? You've got a improving job market throughout the state. Right? Seriously improving job market throughout the state, and it's the expectation whether jobs are going to last. The tech sector is the most optimistic sort of sector in the world. Right? Technology is going to change everything. We're not going to have to do anything except maintain the machines. Right? I have a lot of former students of mine that are in the tech industry. And it's something that, trend, that, that they get transformed when they're there. They become, the most tech heavy, you know, and you're going, yeah, right, go for it, you know, right? But in places like here, labor force participation is the key, right? How does basic County shift? How do these exurban areas where there's opportunities to tap into that, how does that shift happen, right? That's what you guys get to decide, whether you want to make the shift or not, right? But in real terms, that means household income is stagnant or declining, and house prices, you start to get these increasing gaps. Okay? Financing interest rates are historic low. Loans are easier to get than since the financial crisis. It's not as bad as the bad old days. I just bought a house. Not in Seattle, but back in Arkansas. You can't afford Seattle. I work at the university. <laughs> right? But I bought a house in Arkansas. I'm trying to get a lot easier. Easy. I got a mortgage within two days. Right? It was done. That was it. Right? It's, it's, it was easy to get along. Right? You got the availability, you got the geographic constraints of where you are. That's an advantage. Right? You got a lot of vacation homes, lifestyle properties, you got a lot of GMA issues, you've got other issues in terms of purse decision and all the rest of that sort of thing. But the question to ask is what does this mean for housing market? Right? Uh, and then people say, you're the economist, you give us the answers. I'm like, no, you're just about to kind of put out the main issues here, right? Because I don't live here, I don't know this area as well as I probably should. Although I hope to hit all 39 counties before Thanksgiving. I'm close. This is one of my last ones. Mm -hmm. right? This is one of my last ones. But that's up for you guys, right? So with that being said, I'm happy to take any questions you have. And or hand over to the next person, or whatever I need to do. <laughs> so I've got, I got a question for you. So yeah. I represent the 35th district mm -hmm. in the legislature, and that is all of Mason County, mm -hmm. the southern part of Thurston, and western part of Kitsap County. Okay. And that is the most rural district in the state of Washington. Mm -hmm. Okay, you would think that would be an Okanagan County. <laughs> yeah. A fairy county, someplace. Okay. It's not in western Washington, but we only have the city of Shelton, about 10,000 people, and a little bit of river, a little bit of Tumwater. So percentage-wise, 87% of the people in my district live in the country, outside yeah. the, the, mm -hmm. the uh, incorporated areas. But yeah. the one thing that hasn't been mentioned that we really lack mm -hmm. is broadband deployment. Okay. People would love to live here and bring their home-based business or their consulting business or whatever it is. They'd love to live looking at the water or love to live on the lake, but the broadband deployment is so poor yeah. in rural areas yeah. that it is holding us back. Yeah, that's a bit of a chicken and egg situation uh, in terms of you need the infrastructure here, but the infrastructure can't be paid for because of the lack of scale amongst existing users and things. And that, you know, that's a huge. That's a huge issue. Um, it's hard to say how that can happen because if the state gets involved or the government gets involved, a lot of times that ends up not being the latest technology. Or it's slower. There's other issues in relation to that. So it's hard to say what that answer is. 
Well, well the, the public or DUD three here is the leader in trying to yeah. get it out to the rural areas. So we need that, that's the one thing I think is and you talk about first decision, other things, but I think broadband deployment, if you look at what people yeah. are looking for today, yeah. if they want to live in a rural area, they want to avoid traffic, they want a lower price home perhaps, or to get away, that they but they have to have that for their business. Yeah, is, is it the economics of it, do you think? Or what, what, I mean, I'm just opening it up here. I, I, as an economist, it, it's real easy for me to say what the problem is, yeah. <laughs> I mean, but without, without knowing, what, what are the local dynamics? Or is there something? Well, Verizon wants to put that, you know, to put their infrastructure in the city. I mean, they're going to deploy the 5G network in uh, South Lake Union before they're coming to Little Rock. Oh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. But, uh, but that, yeah, that's, I was, is there, but I was wondering if there was a regulatory reason or any other reason why they wouldn't be or anything like that. Economics. It's purely economics from Verizon's part. Mm. Yeah. And I can, I can see that. And that is, a, that is a big issue. That is a big issue. But is PUD, uh, I don't, I'm not familiar with PUD. Pretty, I'll just admit that. This is the electricity company for this area? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I can address that. I'm um, dealing with PD3 and have a pretty role in, in, some, in a rural county that can deal with uh, <laughs> And it is a big issue. I see that really with uh, just feedback we've seen over the years from developers, real estate owners trying to sell homes, people looking at a viable place to live and move, move into this community. Mm -hmm. And it is, and it has to be uh, an issue of uh, how can we as a community look at um, doing things, participating, and um, looking at it. If there is regulatory, uh, there is a little bit. I mean, we are limited, we're wholesale. We don't have the ability to sell directly to the consumer but uh, we think it's important in this community for economic development so uh, we're, we're certainly looking at our we have certain programs to get out in the communities today but uh, again there really is a huge impact for uh, people living out in these rural areas yeah i'm just wondering i'm just kind of thinking out loud in terms of where those opportunities might be to piggyback off the existing infrastructure to say you know that, that if that who, who has who has the line of the people's houses and where you can piggyback there you know, I don't know how that would work either economically. <coughs> At least it might save in terms of these ones and trying to get access and that sort of thing. Uh, I'm not a utilities economist, unfortunately. I probably make a lot more money doing that. Well, if we don't have any further questions right now, Ellen has asked that we take a, a short break in between uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Young's uh, uh, speech and um, Andy's. <laughs> September, year by year by year, we're here, okay? So the number of active listings in September in 2015 was 539. This is Mason County um, through the Northwest Multiple Listing Service. 539 listings in September of 15. In uh, September 16, that number dropped significantly, down to 459. And September this year, 390. Okay. This is the inventory, right? This is the, do we have an inventory problem? Do we have uh, houses to sell to buyers? That number's dwindling, correct? So the number of closed sales over the same time frames, number of closed sales in September of 15, we had 118 closed sales. In September of 16, we had 109. And September this year, 140. 
Okay, so that number's creeping. Um, these two numbers combined lead us to what, um, what the month's supply of inventory, right? And, and the general consensus among, among uh, economists <laughs> is that month supply, if a month supply, if you have six months supply of inventory in your market, you have what's considered a balanced market. More than six, it's starting to lean to the buyer side. Less than six, starting to go to the seller side. So um, in 15, 15 we had uh, 4.6. Okay. In 16, 4.2, relatively similar. This year, 2.7. Okay, this is a really, 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 really simple formula that is this divided by this. Oh, check that. This divided by that. Okay, um, at two point seven months. Um, that's a that's a um, seller's market number, right? So I was asking people um, over the last few days. I made some phone calls to some folks and asked them about challenges that they see or interesting things that they're seeing in the market so that we can make this relevant. Um, and the, uh, uh, oh, well, I'll, 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 I'll pause that for a second. This is a number that we've been tracking for years. I keep, every year I keep saying I'm gonna quit doing it, but I still get asked the question. Um, and so I'm going to provide you with the information. Um, 2008, um, which was just after the high point of our, of our value, um, 13.4 percent of the of the houses in Mason County were, were as a direct result of a, a sale from a bank to a new buyer. Shelton, that number was 19.7, and it was 27. In 2011, uh, 38, or yeah, roughly 38 percent. And in the Shelton area, um, for those of us that are real estate. Folks, the, that's area 175 in our Northwest Multiple Listing Service for those that aren't. That's essentially the urban growth boundary, okay? Um, essentially the urban growth boundary. Over half of the sales in the Shelton area were as a result of a, uh, of a bank selling a house that they had previously foreclosed on. That's a pretty big number. Fortunately, we're down here now, right? So, um, that's how had a good <laughs> This is this is a this coincide. The reason I'm still interested in this information is because back in these days we had I've said this before we had human sellers competing with bank sellers, you know. And, and if you're a, if if you're a human sitting in your house and you want to sell it, and the one next door is half the price of yours. You're going to struggle to get your house sold because you have to have some money. You have to have. You can't. You can't just say, "Well, I'm going to reduce my price by half." What you do is you hunker down and you say, "I'm going to weather this storm," and when that comes back around, then we're going to start making some significant changes. So um, back now that now that this number has dwindled, that competition from the corporate people um, isn't isn't as isn't as prevalent. So it's um, uh, it's really helping with with our median sale prices that we're going to get to. So um, this is where this is where I started. Uh, um, we were thinking about the numbers of sales year by year um, in, in the different price brackets. So zero to 100,000, that number's down by 29 sales, um, which I think we can all agree that that number being down is a good Thing, yeah. right? That, that number's being down is good. Um, 100 to 200, that number's way up. Okay, and then the really interesting thing is this: is this 200 to 250 and 250 to 300? Because I, I when I had it bracketed between 200 and two, 200 and 300, and when I when I really got into the information there, it was there was something that was really really enlightening that, I'll, that we'll bring up in a second. But, um, so, the, to be comparative with the rest of them, you know, these, these two numbers would be combined, okay, so we'd be at, we'd be at uh, 337 
if it was to be going to be corrected in the same way as everybody else. Um, the overall sales are up, right? Overall sales are way up. Uh, we have we have a lot of houses to sell. They're selling, right? The inventory is is more fluid now than it was than it is stagnant, which is where we were for a long time. Home buyer calls you and says, "Hey, I want to go see." I want to go see some properties. The pickings aren't as good. You have to be prepared. Okay. Now, this is where I had some really interesting information that popped up to me. This is month, that same month supply number broken down by price range in in each of those price ranges. Um, it, it makes all the sense in the world that the lower numbers have a lower value or the lower the lower uh, time on the market. The one, that, the one that just intrigues the heck out of me is the $250,000 to $300,000 price range. There's five months supply of listings in that segment, which is right in line with some of the stuff that we've learned earlier. Go ahead. No, uh, that, if you look at, uh, I think that has to do with second months of Fannie Mae limits. Okay. So if you look at Fannie Mae and the financing guidelines, I think that may be. Well, you got to put it slow. Okay. Yeah. That the, it's a bit stickier in terms of any kind of finance. Yeah. So, so I kind of geek out on this stuff, and, and I, I started asking myself why, why, why does this happen? I mean, what, what, what is, what is the part that makes this happen? And, uh, um, well, I'll get back. I'll get back. Um, so this is this is price breakdown by by area in our multiple listing service 16 to 17 compared, right? Again, people with uh, familiar with the Northwest MLS, 170 area 171 on the top, Allen and Greenview on the bottom is 180. It's just right down the list, right? So um, we've had some pretty significant increases in median sale price. That's a median sale price number, okay? In in these neighborhoods, piece by piece by piece. Um, you know, Hartstein, Hartstein is the only negative number there. Um, and what's the reason for that? Well, people probably are, had not buy as many houses at Hartstein Point this year as they did the, the years prior, which would have pushed that number up a little bit. Um, the, the number for the whole county is roughly, median price is roughly 10% higher this time this year than it was last year. But roughly 10%. Okay, so then we get back to what the uh, the challenges of our business. Now, I got all kinds of things, right? I mean, but we, this is what we deal with day to day. <coughs> inventory is inventory really our problem? We have we have we have lots of houses hitting the market. We have lots of houses selling. Although sometimes when you're sitting there and the phone rings, it feels like you have to do this, <laughs> right? Okay, I'm gonna sit here and watch the market until we get until the right thing comes on the market. And you better be ready to go because this is what the realtors look like <laughs> when it hits at this at this state of our state of our world, right? It's we have to get there. Okay. Price push, and this is where this is where that two fifty to three hundred number I think is really interesting. Price push is one of the challenges in that in particular. So I did some research on this, and and the the median. Household income in Mason County is just a touch over fifty thousand dollars, okay, um, which equates to about forty-two hundred dollars a year. And with um, with lending guidelines being front end ratio of what twenty-eight percent still, okay, so twenty-eight percent of that leaves you one thousand one hundred and seventy-six dollars that you that the median income can afford to pay for house taxes insurance. Okay? In order to afford that, you can only afford to borrow two hundred thousand dollars at four and a quarter on a thirty-year note with seventy-five dollars a month in insurance and twenty-two hundred dollars a month in uh, in uh, tax or twenty-two hundred dollars a year in tax. Speed. That totals one thousand one hundred and seventy-three dollars. Two hundred thousand dollars is what our median income can afford, period. The only way that grows 
is we have to grow the median income. Right? And so this, this falls kind of in line with, with what we've been hearing. How do we, how do we, how do we encourage that? Um, a lot of our jobs are government jobs. The growth of those incomes isn't, isn't gigantic, so that's not the answer. The answer's got to be something else. So um, I, I found that to be a really interesting piece. Now, how that translates to the sale price. We've got $250,000 to $300,000 that's sitting there sort of stagnant, right? And the reason my, my brilliant hypothesis <laughs> is, is that we have first-time home buyers that are coming in, they're buying our up to $200,000 properties, and then we're trying to move on, but the folks that live here already and are working here can't afford that next bracket. The, the, the income doesn't support it right now. And so those are sitting, sitting stagnant. We're relying on the, the, the people, the migration in to consume that inventory, and that is happening a little bit more slowly than we would, uh, we would maybe expect. This was a great, that was a great, great question that was raised last night. How, what's, what's the deal with that? Another one of our challenges is the closing process. Just, the, just once we identify buyer and seller, let's get this transaction closed. What's got to happen next? There's a million things that have to happen. Last year, number one on this biggest challenges list was appraisals. We were all just bogged down in the quagmire of appraisal. You know what? So, um, doesn't say, the questions of the people that I asked, and in my own personal experience, was I'm not having that same level of frustration with appraisals this year. They're, they're a little more timely. We're not having as many come in low. It's, it's a little bit better. The closing process, um, when you're working on with a home buyer, when I'm working with a home buyer, seems to be a little more simple than when I'm working with the seller because I'm directing, for the most part, who they're, getting, who they're going to see for the financing, and I have done the background work to see who, I, to find people I know can get transactions closed in an efficient manner, and I'm not relying on XYZ Bank out of Jacksonville, Florida, to manage a, manage a transaction in, in Shelton, Washington. It just doesn't, that when, when, when you're working on the listing side of that transaction, and you get a, you get a pre-approval letter from XYZ out of Jacksonville, Every time. <laughs> Every single time. And it's, um, you, and, you, and oh, it's not going to be that way this time. It's not going to be that way this time. And then six weeks later, you're waiting and you're attempting to educate people who should know what they're doing. Okay. Have you heard back from them today? <laughs> 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 I have not. <laughs> so the next, the next piece is uh, was almost a unanimous, um, unanimous answer in the phone calls that I made, and this is by no way meant to offend anybody. It's just it is, it's a reality. New real estate brokers, new real estate brokers are a challenge in our business because. Nobody's out there educating these people. They're, they're, getting their, they're going to get their, their education from the state. They're licensed to screw up people's lives forever. <laughs> right? I mean, that's the reality of it. And nobody's educating them how to do it right. And we have, we have some fairly specific, you have to have your, your files checked and your this and your that for two years before you can be officially on your own. Ish. Yes. Right? I mean that's that's not practical. So so in every transaction, not everyone, but but you get it put a new property on the market and real estate broker from Kalamazoo writes an offer on it, says, I'm so excited to work on this. This is my first deal. <laughs> <laughs> And just and they're and they've been pre-approved with X Y Z in Jacksonville. <laughs> right? I mean, it's, it's really problematic, and it's 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 it is just a it's just 
If you are a real estate, new real estate broker, go get education. Do it. Find somebody that will teach you and have them teach you well because it is crucial. It is crucial. <laughs> Okay. Another another one that we have contractors. We talked about that a little bit. Getting contractors to do the work that we need to get real estate transactions done. We need to get this queen spread out underneath the house. We're having trouble finding somebody that can do it. You know, no, not finding somebody that can do it. Finding somebody that is still licensed to do it. Because there was a lot of people that were licensed to do this back in the two, five, six, seven, and then they got stung, right? And they had to go to work. They couldn't be a general contractor anymore. They had to go to work, and so, and now they're hesitant to go out and stick their neck out again because they lost their house, they lost their everything, right? And so they're not they're not willing to just jump back in the fire yet. But we need them because we're we have more work. We have more work than we can than we can. Get done. Get Yo. Do you think we can do like a countywide like list? Maybe? <laughs> a so countywide list of contractors? Oh uh, yeah, contractors, cleaners, handymen, painters, plumbers. I don't know because it's hard. <laughs> it, it's really, really hard. It's it, um, yes. Go so, ahead. Uh, yeah. If you go to Cameo Inspections out of Thurston County, he has a affiliate list for plumbers, electricians, contractors, everybody in the county. And it's, you can download it and print it, and it's there. They're really good quality. And they come to Mason County as well. So yes, that would be dynamite. You know, but you make the phone call and it says, hey, I'm six to eight weeks out. Right? That's, that's really problematic for, for our... Six to eight weeks is a long time to babysit a real estate transaction. <laughs> it's a long time. Okay. So... What does the new construction in the county look like? The new, the new single family residential building permits. This is not multifamily, this is not commercial, this isn't anything. Uh, through, through September um, 16, there's 140 in Mason County. This is unincorporated Mason County. Uh, and then in 1733, I, I got this big spreadsheet from, from the uh, from from the uh, permit center, and I think that I got them all, but there might be a couple that are that are not in that. Um, city of Shelton, uh, city of Shelton, in sixteen, there were ten, there were ten through September in, in the city of Shelton, and so far this year, eighteen. Okay, so there are there are there are people building houses. And they're, they're selling. So this is, this is where we're going to get into comparing how we are, um, how we compare with, with those counties and, and folks around us. There's a property that's currently available for sale on Harvard Avenue. Um, and this is, this is I, I pulled this off of Zillow this morning. I screenshot this off of Zillow this morning. And this is, because Zillow, I mean, we've said this before. That's where people are looking for real estate, right? So this is we've got to pay attention to what they're seeing here. Um, they look at the neighborhoods. They look at the neighborhood stuff, and this is uh, the median estimate: nine eight five eight four is two nineteen, and this house is fifty four four percent more expensive than the median, but it's fifteen point five percent less per square foot, right? It's a big house, okay. Then they scroll down to the school section, right? And this is what the school looks like on, the schools in the area look like on paper. We have the Shelton School District is a, a three on the, on the Zillow scale, whatever the Zillow scale is, okay? Um, South Side is seven. Pioneer is five. Pioneer just built a new, uh, Pioneer just built a new, uh, junior high and, and added on to the elementary and it looks it looks great. I should, you should go check that out if you haven't seen that. It's really cool. Uh, Hood Canal School District is a two on this list. Um, uh, North Basin's a five. Great View School's a six. Uh, Griffin, just the neighbor to the south, is an eight. 
Okay, so people are people that are moving into the area making these decisions based on where their where their where their families can go to school. And they don't like necessarily what they see in some cases, and 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 that's a little bit of, um, that's a challenge that we deal with every day. This number I've been tracking for quite a while now, and it's how Mason County's median sale price relates percentage on a percentage basis. It's similar to the similar to the graph that we saw with the state. And, the, and Mason's going together, except for I'm not nearly as creative and I have data tables. Um, and so Mason County uh, in 2003, our value was at, our median sale price was at 125. In 2007, which was at the height of the market, we were at $207,000. And as of right now, we're at 207,747. For a increase for the first time I've ever tracked this data of 0.36%. Okay, um, essentially that's, good. that's real good. You yeah. crawled out of that hole, right? Um, Thurston County's all-time high, not all-time high, previous all-time high, 265, 950. Today, 285, which is a 7% increase over over 2007 numbers. And the same old and and in Kitsap, Kitsap, the 291 was the number, 303 is now, and it's a 6.2 or a 3.32 percent increase. Okay, so um, this percentage number down here is the percentage that our median is of Thurston County. We are currently 72.89 percent of Thurston County median. Make sense? Okay. And we are 67.03% of Kitsap counties. Okay, our neighbors, our neighbors are doing better than we are, um, and uh, and and we got we have some work to do. This is my this is my my, my favorite part of this, right? So there's our house up on Harvard. Okay, this is 2,606 square feet. It's on Harvard, just right in the city limits. Three bedroom, two and a half bath on 1.44 acres. It's got that garage attached, and then back behind there's a there's a three bay shop that's a nice building also, um, and that property is currently listed for two hundred eighty five thousand bucks. This in Thurston County, this is over uh, sort of um, off of Boulevard, which is over near Olympia High School, Yelp Highway, over in that area. Okay, this is two hundred ninety two square feet, or excuse me, twenty six hundred ninety two square feet. It's a four bedroom, two and a quarter bath. It's on an acre and a half, and it also has a pretty decent sized detached shop building. Uh, and this property sold in seven days for 360. Okay, it's a, uh, last year this was exactly a hundred thousand dollar difference. This year's not quite as much, right? Um, this house, this particular house, is not in the, in the finished condition that that one is. I mean, that, this the, the one in Thurston County needs new floors and kitchens and, and all of this sort of thing. And this one, this one's pretty pretty nice place. So we're still we're still lagging behind. And eighty five thousand dollars buys a lot of gas, right? And and that's what we're banking on. But this is right in that this is right in that price range. Where we have where we have the higher supply, okay, and and the and the folks that are the, the the median income in Shelton and Mason County can't afford that house, where a year ago they would have, they could, okay. So I think that's all I got. Yep, that's all I got. <laughs> uh, Wrapping it up, and uh, Keith uh, wants to do a little presentation or a share on our 2017 uh, fall conference in Pasco when we were there. Uh, okay, I'll keep this really brief. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's got it right here on my my, my notes here. Um, we had a, a great fall conference. There was lots and lots of information. Um, and uh, so I attended almost all of the meetings that were there. 
And uh, kind of the big talk of the conference, a lot of the conference um, centered around discussion about herds. And if you're like me, there's only a few people probably in this room that have like intimate knowledge of what happened at the legislature this year um, with regard to Hearst. And I'll just, just bear with me here because I'm going to botch this up for sure. But, you know, it, it affects us all. It's uh, some of us on different levels than others. But um, I recently had a sale fall through um, due to this. And, and um, but immediately resold the land the next day. So, you know, go figure. Um, so it doesn't appear to be really uh, affecting our land sales um, here, but um, it's a big shadow overhanging um, our county. And uh, so the legislature came fairly close this year to coming up with a, a plan on Hearst. It, it fell apart at the last um, at the last uh, minute, it died in committee, and oddly enough, um, the word I got was that the, really the Republicans couldn't work, could not agree on the Hearst workout. Um, and um, I'm not being political, but that's that's the story I kind of I kind of heard, um, and the and from a couple of different sources um, at the conference. Um, interestingly enough, one of the proposals that came very close and. Um, was that uh, there would be a $300 per well fee if our capital budget, our state capital budget was actually passed. And if our state capital budget didn't pass, then, um, then there, the well fee per well would be $1,500. And that proposal got a lot of traction and made it a long way and um, um, that those dollars would go towards um, fees uh, that would support in-stream flow mitigation programs. And so, um, as always, the things political usually come down to money. And so I think we can look forward to that sort of resolution with Hearst, um, possibly this coming year. There's a lot of people on board. Um, the other thing that, I, that came out of it was that there's a real, a real growing divide between the rural, urban sen senators and legislators, uh, between the rural and urban senators and legislators, and uh, that many of the urban politicians are really ambivalent about Hearst and why shouldn't they be? Um, and as it was noted, we're kind of, kind of being governed from capital, the other Capitol Hill. And, uh, and so, anyway, the state capital budget is tied politically to the Hearst workout. So there was a lot of, a lot of stuff that happened. Um, there was a lot of effort. The realtors, um, I went to two different meetings and, and heard, heard basically the same story. Um, a lot went into it. A lot of effort went into the potential solution, but it didn't happen. Um, I want to talk a little bit. Uh, our PAC raised over $1 million in 2017. Statewide, I think one. That's 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 a huge amount of money. Um, um, there's a record number of participants, and and uh, so let's see if there's a, D Dino Ross. Dino Rossi is going to run for Congress, um, and that's uh, you know he's very heavily backed by uh, Washington Realtors, uh, both of his government. Uh, governor campaigns. And so that's pretty much it. There's a lot more. Uh, let's see if there's anything else. Oh, the new realtor building. Um, if you haven't driven by that, the old building is completely tore down, torn down, and uh, new construction um, has started. Scheduled completion is the third quarter of 2017. Uh, uh, maybe that's 18. I think that should be 2018. And so um, that is coming along. That's going to be really cool. Um, I guess that's it. So thank you very much. So with all of that being said, um, does anybody here have anything for the good of the order? And uh, if so, if not, then we're done. Anything? Meeting adjourned.